Okay, so thanks everyone uh, for coming. Uh, today, uh, we have Naomi Sweeting from Harvard speaking about uh, Kohlewagen's conjecture and higher congruences for, of modular forms. All right, um, thank you for the introduction and um, thanks very much for the invitation to speak here. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as usual, feel free to interrupt me with questions. Um, if, I, if I forget to pause for questions, it's not because I don't want to answer them, just because I forgot. Um, so with that, let me, let me get started. Um, so sort of the, the motivation or the context um, is we're interested in the rational points of, of an elliptic curve over Q, so say with conductor N. Um, so one good way to get started here is um, you know, to maybe produce some meaningful points um, using the modular parameterization. Um, now, of course, uh, X naught of N is some high genus curve. Um, you don't expect it to have a lot of rational points, but it has one very nice family of rational points, which are the CM points. So if, if you have an imaginary quadratic field K um, in which factors of N split, um, then you can make a, a, a Hegner point, a CM point on this curve X naught of N. The hypothesis that all factors of N are split are just so that you can make an N isogeny. So, I mean, you might, you might want to do this using the full ring of integers OK, and you'll get a rational point de defined over the Hilbert class field of K. Um, but there's nothing so special about OK. So if you used a, um, an order in, in K of conductor N, then you could also get a, a CM point defined over the ring class field of conductor N. Um, so we, we need to um, work in a somewhat more general context, um, so a slightly expanded idea of a CM point. So let's, let's let K now be an imaginary quadratic field where N breaks up into factors that split in N and factors that are inert, the factors that split in K and factors that are inert. Um, so we have to assume that N minus is square free with an, odd, with an even number of prime factors. The reason for that constraint is that that's what you need to make the Shimura curve, um, X N plus comma N minus which parameterizes abelian surfaces um, with an action of a quaternion algebra of discriminant n minus and your usual uh, gamma naught of n plus level structure. So what are the CM points on here? Well, if you, if you sort of base change to k, um, your, your quaternion algebra uh, splits and is just two by two matrices. So having an action of two by two matrices, um, I mean, the the way you can get that is by just taking a self product of, of, of a CM curve. Um, so our CM points here are going to be uh, Y of N, uh, just like before, again, defined over the ring class field of conductor N, and now corresponding to you know, some, some abelian surface. Um, and the reason that these CM points still have something to say about the rational points on E is that there's still a modular parameterization from the Jacobian of the Shimura curve to E. Um, that's, I mean, that's the content of, of Jack A. Langlands. So, um, so what did uh, Coley Wagen do? Um, he, so for certain square free conductors, uh, little n, Coley Wagen defined cohomology classes um, with values in the uh, torsion points of E, so Galois cohomology classes, um, using these CM points Y of n. Um, a few things I want to highlight about these. Um, Obviously, we'll talk about them a lot throughout the talk. First of all, these n, um, these are really square free. So if you're an Iwasawa theorist, you might want to take like large powers of p as the conductor. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. Um, the other thing is that when n is 1, this is exactly the, the classical Hegner point, which is um, just what you get from the, the thing of conductor 1 by tracing it down to k. And this, this number m here, you should really think of as a precision. Um, so somehow, if you if you multiply this class by p, the, you just bump down m down by one. Um, I guess the the other warning here is that c m of n um, is not going to be uh, necessarily a Coomer image. Um, I wrote Coomer image of e of k, but it's not going to be a Coomer image of anything necessarily. Um, my point is that the the construction of these classes is not so direct. It's not like you just take the Coomer image of y of n. You you have some some other operation which sort of obscures, um, and you don't know that these actually come from rational points. Um, so Coley Wagen um, defined these integers MR. Um, so MR is the smallest number so that there exists an N with R prime factors with CMR of N non zero. 
So that, that's like a real mouthful. Um, but what, what this is trying to say is that um, as you add primes into n, it gets easier and easier for your classes to not vanish. So these, these MR are, are decreasing sequence. They could, they could be infinite. Um, it could be that it's quite possible that all of the classes could vanish a priori, you don't know. Um, but sort of once, once you get one, one thing that doesn't vanish, sort of from there on out, as you add in more primes, that just vanishes less and less. Um, right, so because this is a decreasing sequence of integers, it has some limit m infinity. Um, so coley wagens conjecture um, is that this m infinity number is finite. Um, I mean, he, he wrote this down when the Galois representation is surjective, but I think, um, I don't think people expect that to really be necessary. Um, that's sort of something that he used in, in his like Euler system arguments in this paper. Um, so, uh, so, so, yeah. sorry, uh, is, does the construction also partly use the irreducibility or something? I mean, there is some mild hypothesis, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's completely right. So you, you, you need a little, you need some hypotheses on the Galois representation to, um, for the classes, for the construction to work. Um, but you could get away with less than, than surjective. I think absolutely irreducible um, is probably enough or something, something milder. Anyway, that's, that's not too important because I'm going to let the Galois representation be surjective um, in the rest of this talk. I just uh, uh, wanted to point out that uh, I don't, I don't, I think that it, people, I think, expect it to hold in a little more generality than that. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so coley wagen showed that uh, these, these numbers, MR, actually sort of know all about the Selmer group. Um, so if you uh, consider the p-infinity Selmer group, um, it breaks up into eigenspaces for complex conjugation. Uh, so let's let the co-ranks, the ZP co-ranks of the different pieces be RP plus minus. So coley wagen proved that if his conjecture is true, if m-infinity is finite, then you can look at the smallest new so that m nu is finite. And this new encodes information about the Selmer rank. So one, one eigenspace of the Selmer group is going to have rank nu plus one. The other eigenspace will have rank bounded above by nu. And altogether, you'll get something of odd rank, which is what's predicted by the sign of the functional equation for e. Um, questions? Any more questions so far about the setup? Uh, so, sorry, like, just historic question, but but did Kolewagin really consider like general Shimura curve setup, or it was someone else later? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I uh, I attempted to somewhat ally that distinction, but you're one hundred percent right. Um, Kolewagin was was thinking about the sort of classical case of x naught of n. Um, I'm not sure who first introduced um, the the Shimura curve perspective, um, but. Uh, yeah, it was it was not introduced by me. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, here is the the main result of the talk. Um, so I'll jump to the conclusion, which is that m infinity is finite. Um, so coley wagens conjecture holds, and there are some technical hypotheses. I want to point out that the first hypothesis is some in some sense the most meaningful. Um, you we use this uh, this n minus uh, having an even number of uh, prime factors um, to in order to construct the the classes in the first place. The rest of the the rest of the hypotheses um, are are sort of um, more more technical, less less fundamental. Um, so I I'm telling you that m infinity is finite. Um, it's very fair to ask what it is, um, and there's one situation in which we know exactly what m infinity is supposed to be. So if if e has rank one over k, then we have um, this very nice uh, BSD formula, which I, I think is a theorem in a lot of cases, which tells you that m infinity is, is basically determined by these local Tamagawa factors um, for primes dividing n plus. So um, the, that the Tamagawa factor is going to be zero if, if the representation is residually ramified um, at, at L. So the first really um, groundbreaking work on this conjecture was done by Wei Zhang um, in 2013 or 2014, um, who proved that m infinity was exactly one, assuming that these Tamagawa factors vanish and some other hypotheses that we'll um, mention more later. 
Um, and the way Wei Zhang proved this um, is uh, similar to, to the way uh, this theorem goes. Um, so you have you use congruences of modular forms to connect sort of the, the question about E to a question about a rank zero modular form, which is then easier to handle um, because, I mean, thanks to uh, some very powerful theorems by um, Kato and skinner Urban, we know all about the rank zero BSD formula. Um, so sort of the rank zero case is well understood. And if you have, con if you have, if you construct the right congruences, you can extract information uh, for the curve that you started with. Um, right, but already, uh, hopefully it's, it's sort of believable um, how if we want to show cases where M infinity is larger than one, we might need to look at higher congruences of modular forms. Because if, if, um, if you only have a congruence mod M, it'll sort of only, uh, only only have a congruence mod P, you'll sort of only see mod P information. And this M infinity is, is some sort of higher, uh, if, if M infinity is larger than one, you'll need some kind of higher order information. Um, questions so far about the statement of the theorem? All right. Um, I, I want to mention um, briefly the, the most famous consequence of, of coley Loggins conjecture. So, um, gross um, uh, kind of very famous result, obviously, um, which says that the, the analytic rank of E is exactly one if and only if the Hegner point YK is non-torsion. And it's, it's often called the theorem of gross and coley wagen because coley wagens work that I already uh, mentioned earlier actually implies that if YK is non-torsion, then the mordel vey rank is exactly one. Um, so why is why is that equivalent to um, to the version I gave? So if y k is non-torsion, um, that means that some C M of one is non-zero. Remember, C M of one was the Coomer image of y k. And if that's the case, well, that's equivalent to m zero being finite because m zero uh, one has zero prime factors. And if m zero is finite, then m infinity is finite. So coley wagens theorem kicks in to tell you that the one part of the summer group has rank one. And the other part is rank MO zero. So you put it together and you get rank one. Um, and of course, once you have some are rank one and you have a non torsion point, then you have more delta rank one. Um, so uh, if so now if you um, so if you know Coley Wagen's conjecture, you get a converse to Gross Zaghi and Coley Wagen. Um, so suppose that the summer rank is one then you can show that the, the um, analytic rank is also one, which has you know, the lovely consequences that the analytic rank and the mordel vey rank are exactly one, and also Sha P is, is finite. Um, so how does that work? So suppose M infinity is finite. Well, what's kind of nice about coley Wagen's um, Euler system argument is that it gives you a lower bound as well as an upper bound. So it gives you the lower bound that the summer rank is at least nu plus one. So as a result, if the summer rank is, is exactly one, it means that nu is zero. And as we said, that's the same as CM of one being non-zero for a large enough M, which is the same as YK being indivisible, which means it, it's gonna have to be non-torsion. Now, of course, this is not the first converse to gross Zaghi and coley Wagen that's appeared. Um, uh, Chris Skinner had gave a purely sort of Iwasawa theory um, converse and there are, many different approaches now, uh, all of them sort of are and to some degree Iwasawa theoretic in nature. So the um, the proof of coley Wagen's conjecture that I'm going to explain um, is really reliant on, on rank zero kind of Iwasawa theory. Um, so it's it's sort of a matter of which kind of, uh, of input you wanna take, maybe you get slightly different hypotheses. But this is this is one thing that you get out of uh, coley Wagen's conjecture. Okay, um, questions before I start talking about the sketch of the proof? All right. Um, so let, let me talk about sort of the basic architecture of, of how the proof works, and then we'll go back and fill in a lot more details. So the, the first sort of um, thing to know is that, is that we're embedding the coley Wagen system into a, a larger one. So instead of CM of N, uh, we add an extra index Q. So the original, uh, the original ones were when Q equals one. So again, these live in the 
um, Gawa cohomology of the torsion of E. And CM NQ is going to come from um, a CM point Y of NQ that lives on the uh, Shimura curve uh, of level N minus Q. Um, and of course, you know, still, still rational over the ring class field. Um, so what is this Q here? Um, you should really think of it this as a level raising index. So this N is a conductor, but Q is about level raising. Um, and of course, whenever you have level raising, um, there's some kind of congruence involved. And that congruence is going to impose um, sort of a, a constraint on how big M can be. So you can only take M only so large, depending on, depending on how deep the congruence is attached to Q. Oh, I also want to mention here that Q, there's like a parity constraint here. Because if you want to have a, um, a Shimura curve, N minus Q has to have an even number of prime factors. Um, so not every, uh, yeah, you, you can't, uh, Q, Q, there are some constraints on Q. So the, the way the, the general uh, structure goes is that we're going to find a sequence of mod P to the M eigenforms um, where we sort of add primes into the level one at a time. And they're all going to be congruent to F and their Selmer ranks are going to decrease. So F could have started with very large Selmer rank. By the time we get to the, the top FQ, we want, uh, we want Selmer rank zero or Selmer rank Somewhere rank one, I guess. So yeah, so what's going to happen at the top there? Um, so the key input is going to be that CM1 comma Q is non-zero for a certain Q. Um, so this is this is sort of analogous to being in the rank one situation with the classical Heegner point. The, the way we get this input is actually not from FQ, but from something even one level higher. So actually from a, a rank zero form of level NQ little Q. Um, which is going to be congruent to F. But what's really special about this form and very different from, from uh, these FQs is that it's, it has to be characteristic zero. And we'll talk about that more later. Um, but yeah, just keep in mind, there's sort of a really special step happening like at the top and then, uh, and then sort of less special steps interpolating between them. Um, right, so coley -Wagen showed that the vanishing order of, of his classes, meaning how many primes you have to put into N before, they've, before they're before they non-zero, he showed that vanishing order had to do with the Selma rank. And in a very similar way, um, for at these, for these, um, for like a fixed Q, um, the vanishing order, oh, sorry, um, the vanishing order is related to sort of a level raised Selma rank, um, which you can think of as the P Selma rank of this mod P to the M modular form. Now, of, of course, if it's just a mod P to the M modular form, I, I would have to say what I mean by the Selmer group. Um, but in any case, some, some appropriate analogy of the Selmer group. Um, yeah, so the, just structurally, what's going to happen is that we, we start at the top level with this special G. And there, CM1Q is non-zero. And we're going to sort of go back down, adding more primes into N as we go. And when we get to the bottom, N might have a lot of primes in it. So, so in practice, obviously, you, um, the, you must have some kind of relationship with, between all these CM and Qs in order to do anything meaningful, right? Um, so the, the relationships that we use are sort of twofold. There's this horizontal relationship, which was originally discovered by coley -Boggin. Um So that's, that's at the uh, vanishing order. Um, sorry, the, when I write ORD here, I just mean uh, sort of like how, uh, how indivisible it is. Um, so the, the order of, of CMNQ um, is related to the order of CMNLQ, at least if you localize it L. Um, so that's- I'm so, sorry, uh, this, uh, this L is some sp specific kind of prime. Yes, that's right. Um, L is a specific kind of prime. Um, I'm going to talk uh, more about that later, but um, yeah, so there are only, you can only define these classes for, for special primes, yeah. Um, and then there's a vertical relationship, um, which is that uh, the as you add two primes into, into capital Q, um, there's some relationship. Now here, this is an approximate relationship. And um, you should think of this as, as approximately equal. Like, don't worry about the direction of the inequality. Um, this is a little error term here. Um, yeah, so if, if we were in, in Wei Zhang's world, um, the, this error term would be zero. Uh, but because we have these higher congruences, it's it's not hard to just accept this error term. 
anyway, that again, that's something uh, I plan to say more about. Um, but yeah, so what I what I want to say here is um, the this crucial downward step. So you have non-vanishing at level Q, Q1, Q2, and you have to turn that into non-vanishing at level Q. Now, just superficially, you might say, well, where do the new primes come in? Like, if if this is non-zero, isn't that non-zero from this relationship? But what's special about this vertical congruence is that you have to localize the the level raised class at Q2. Um, so for that reason, it could be that CM that everything say every uh, it could be that CM one Q Q one Q two is non-zero, but after you localize at Q two, it is zero. So that's that's why you're going to get more primes in N as you go down. Um, and you you're really going to need the horizontal relationship uh, in order to like find the right primes to add in at each step. Um, right. So one comment at this point about the error term here. Um, so as we sort of continue this process, the errors are going to add up. Um, and at the end, what we're going to end up with is an inequality like this, where the uh, vanishing order of the thing that you're actually interested in, um, or the indivisibility of the thing you're interested in, um, you get a lower bound. Um, and this new of Q, this is how many steps you had to do, um, because at every step you lost a little bit of precision. Um, yeah, so this is something that sort of philosophically, once you're working with higher congruences of modular forms, you you have all this flexibility, you have all this wiggle room. Because if um, if you have a big congruence, like you can have an error term like this, and as long as you can make M really, really big, uh, and as long as you can make sure that none of the error terms depend on how big you wanted M to be, you can you can um, make sure that this right-hand side is positive. Is the right-hand side uh, non-negative? Right, that's exactly the point. It's not, it's not automatically non-negative. You have to be smart about how you're choosing M. If you choose M to be one, that will not be such a good choice because this error term will exist. And so this order, Maybe I should say the order here is at most m because this is an element of a of a space that's p to the m torsion. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is it's not automatic that this is positive. You, um, it's really like you have to make m in advance large enough that it will be positive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. Okay. Um, so let me uh, say what I want to do in the rest of the talk. Um, so first, I want to tell you about level raising. So how do we make these mod p to the m forms fq? And remember, from the structure of the proof, we kind of need a lot of them. Um, so this, the second thing I want to say is just how you construct the CMN queues using this form fq. Um, and finally, I want to talk about what I guess you could call the base case, although it's not, it's not literally an induction argument, um, this construction of this one very special form g. Um, and controlling CM1Q for this one very special Q. And this is where rank zero BSD is gonna come in and also some deformation theory is going to enter the picture. Um, but actually, before I start doing those goals, a uh, quick diversion um, is that if, uh, so hopefully it's believable um, that once we've, we've uh, added, once, once we allow ourselves to add these primes Q, you could also define if, if n minus is an odd number of prime factors, you could define classes like this whenever Q has an, uh, has an odd number of prime factors. And you can get a non-vanishing result for this uh, system as well. And in this, in this situation, you also get, can extract some data about the Selma rank um, from, from the vanishing or non-vanishing of these points. Anyway, um, I, don't, I don't wanna talk too much about that. I just wanna mention that it's possible. Okay, so level raising. So first of all, let me tell you what I even mean by level raising. Um, so think of a level n that we split into two pieces, um, say co-prime to each other. So you can look at the um, the space of modular forms of weight two, level n, trivial character. Everything is going to be weight two and trivial character. Weight two, level n, that happen to be new at all factors of n two. And if you look at the HECA operators acting on that space, that gives you a certain HECA algebra. And of course, it's a quotient of the HECA algebra of level n. Um, and that quotient just corresponds to the fact that the, um, you're restricting the action 
of the operators on, on the full space of modular forms of level n to a certain subspace. So what I mean by level raising is if, if we take any set of primes q um, where n and q are co-prime, we can just view our form, say, that we started with, f, um, as an old form of level n times q. Uh, now, OK, there's a little bit of choice involved, but in any case, you can, you can think of it as, a, as an old form. And then it's going to induce a map from the Heck al algebra of level n q, say, to, um, to z to z mod p to the m, um, so just reducing f. So we, we're going to call q a level raising set if this map right here factors through uh, tn comma q, so the q nu quotient. Now, of course, if you just map to z, it's not going to factor through t n q because f is old. But if you uh, reduce mod p to the m, sometimes, in fact, it does, does factor. But the, the key thing to um, beware of when dealing with these, uh, with these mod p to the m eigenforms is that maps like this don't need to lift to characteristic 0 or to any DDR. And because that obstruction uh, is pretty important, I want to um, remind you why that is or tell you one or the other. Um, so if m equals 1, then yes, every, every uh, map like that does, does in fact lift. But if m is, is big, there's, there's no reason that it would. So here's a toy example to um, maybe illustrate what's going on. So suppose we just have two modular forms and one HECA operator, so kind of a toy example. And the HECA operator acts by this matrix, so one eigenvalue p, one eigenvalue 2p. The HECA algebra is the quotient that corresponds to its action, which in this case is the quotient by the characteristic polynomial. So if you look at maps from this thing, say into z mod p squared, you'll have lots of maps. Because if you send t to any um, multiple of p, um, you will, it, this will, uh, you know, you, you'll get a well-defined map. Uh, now, of course, if you wanted to map this into a domain, you would have to choose, is TP or is T2P? But because you're mapping to something uh, that's not a domain, you, you get this sort of Frankenstein uh, kind of map that you can put together out of, out of multiple eigenforms. Another way of saying what's going on here is that T is not normal. So in the, in the toy example, the normalization would just be embedding this ring into ZP2, ZP squared, where T goes to P and 2P. And obviously, for ZP squared, you don't have this, this property. Um, yeah, so that, that's why um, we, we're going to uh, you know, encounter that. That's why we're going to need some deformation theory, um, because there's, there's really no way to go from a mod P to the M uh, ring map like this to, to an eigenform. Um, right, so, so here's, here's sort of um, a key part of the level raising story. Um, so the, the modular Jacobian um, J naught of n decomposes up to isogeny as a product of simple factors, say with Hecke action if you want. Um, and these, these factors correspond to the, the weight to uh, modular forms of level n, right? So um, if you look at instead of the Shimura curve of level n1 comma n2, um, then you'll get a similar isogeny decomposition, but you'll only get factors that are new at n2. Um, so this, just from looking at these two descriptions, uh, you, it's very believable that if you look at the, the sort of n2 new part of j naught of n, you should be able to make some isogeny between that and j n1, n2. Uh, but sadly, um, as far as anybody knows, there is not a natural isogeny between them. So it's sort of this funny thing where you they're isogenous, but not, not really canonically. Um, another, um, so, okay, so if you look at this n2 new quotient of j naught of n, um, I like to think of this as a very algebraic object um, because it satisfies a multiplicity one property. So that, that means that if you look at its Tate module completed at a reasonable maximal ideal, it's going to be free of rank two over the Hecke algebra. And that's with the Galois action on, on T2, um, where the trace of Frobenius uh, is, is TL, and the determinant is, is the cyclotomic character. So, so that's what that means is that J-min like, knows all about the Hecke algebra. It's like very closely related to the Hecke algebra. But JN1 and 2 is, is sort of more geometric. I mean, it, it's a Jacobian. Um, it doesn't satisfy multiplicity one in general. 
but it has a T isogenated J min, as I said. And David Hill has some really interesting work um, where he studies the space of these T isogenies. Um, and he didn't write this down explicitly, but if you sort of go through his paper, you can actually put a bound on an isogeny between them, at least locally at M. So here's what I mean by that. Um, define this error term C1 of N2 um, to be the sum over factors of N2 that are unramified in the residual representation of the, the valuation, the chaotic valuation of L minus one. Um, right, oh, I wanna mention here that C1 of N2, that's the exact same error, that's the same error term that showed up before um, in, the, um, in the vertical relationship of the Higner points. Um, and this is, this is a quantity that is assumed to be zero in, in Wei Zhang's paper. And actually in, in, a lot of, um, in a lot of papers sort of in this area, this is often assumed to be zero. But because we're working mod P of the M, we can, as I mentioned, get away with just, just accepting this error. So what I mean by error um, is something actually uh, pretty precise. So we have maps between J min and J n one and two, whose composition in either direction is is um, p to this power on on the on the emmatic Tate modules. So yeah, they might not be dual isogenies necessarily. Um, I I guess because J min isn't isn't self dual, but in any case, you know you you have maps like this. So they tell you that Jn1 and 2 and J min are sort of good approximations to each other. And a, a little corollary of this that I, I, I think is kind of fun is you can also think of this in the in the definite case. So when nu of n2 has so when n2 has an odd number of prime factors, and instead of a Shimura curve, you only have a Shimura set, which is like a double coset space for this definite quaternion algebra. So um, by by uh, sort of extracted from from this from these maps you can get maps between the HECA algebra and the sort of uh, module free Z module on the Shimura set, whose composition in either direction is again this error term. So again, these are these are spaces that when you tensor with Q, they're the same by Jack A. Langlands. But uh, before you tensor with Q, there, there aren't canonical maps between them. Um, I, guess, I guess I could pause for questions if people have questions about this. Can you give a hint on um, how are you attaching a Selma group to these mod P to the M forms? Oh, um, yeah. So it's it's actually um, pretty simple. You just look at the Selma group for for E P to, for E, um, you know, the P to the M torsion Selma group, and you just flip the local conditions at the primes that you're adding to like a transverse local condition. Uh, what I'm confused about. So E is an elliptic curve, right? So you, mm -hmm. so to make that, you had to assume something elliptic to characteristic zero. Right, so so E is an elliptic curve, so you you have a Selmer group for E, yeah, um, and then you can look at you you have a P to the M Selmer group, also, um, and you you that's defined by some local conditions, and when we add primes, we're going to change the local conditions that the primes we're adding. Um, how do you uh how do, how do you make that Selmer group directly from this like Heka? Character into Z mod P to the M. I, I mean, is this? Um, I mean, I, maybe I'll answer your question later. Um, this. Let, okay. let me ask this question again later if you still have it. Okay. 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 Sorry. Um, let me uh, let me say what the what the level raising um, result is. So, um, right. So. Take a mod P to the M eigenform um, and suppose that it satisfies this kind of congruence where F of TL is plus or minus L plus one. So this is sort of the standard level raising congruence for some uh, L that's not dividing M. Um, then uh, the output is that there's a level raising form um, of level. So you started with something new, that's something N2 new, and now you get something N2L new. And you get a little error. Um, you might lose a little bit of precision in your form. Um, and it's level raising. Well, you can just the, uh, what I mean by that is just that the Hecke eigenvalues are are the same, um, except at L where something else happens, but it's a very predictable something else. Um, yeah. So before I tell you how to prove it, I want to 
mention how this compares to sort of um, other level raising results that are that are out there. Um, so what's what's really useful about this for our purposes is that um, the input and output are of the same type. So we start with something that doesn't necessarily lift, and we get something that doesn't necessarily lift. So we can start from our our original f associated to the elliptic curve and add as many level raising crimes as we want, one at a time, and we'll get mod p to the m maps at every level. Um, the other the other thing to point out about this um, is that if if m is one, then this is this is uh, very well known and um, in a way, um, yeah, so you, you sort of don't need the error. Um, and the reason it's easy when m equals 1 is that you, you, can, uh, you can lift a characteristic 0. Right, so how, do, how does the proof for this go? Um, so it sort of depends on the parity of n2. Um, so let me, let me explain the version where n2 has an even number of prime factors, and the odd version is something kind of similar, but um, a little different. So we... As I mentioned before, we have a Shimura set, um, sort of a double coset space for a definite quaternion algebra of level N two L, um, and this is sort of an N this is sort of an N two L new object. Like the the Hecke algebra that acts on this is the is the N two L new Hecke algebra. Um, but this also has a geometric connection. Um, this is the the also the set of super singular points um, on the mod L super singular points on the Shimura curve x n1 n2. So using that, you can make a map. You can just take a formal sum of, of these uh, elements of the Shimura set and turn it into a divisor in the obvious way. Um, this zero just means I want things that sum to zero. That's that's not so important. And then I can use this um, this map from Helm to go from j n1 n2 to j min. And once I'm in j min, well j min um, it's FL squared points uh, just from uh, J min's really close relationship to the Hecke algebra. You can realize this as um, as some quotient of the um, of the rank two, uh, you know, the thing that's free of rank two over the Hecke algebra. And from here, you can use your original F because now this J min is level n one n two, so that so your F can sort of apply to take you into Z mod p to the m. So eventually you will get a composite from this N2L kind of new object to something mod P to the M. And what, what we're gonna want is for that map to be surjective or almost surjective. If that map were zero, it wouldn't be telling us anything. But if it's almost surjective, then you can look at the action. It's a Hecke equivariant map. So the action is going to be uh, like looking at the eigenvalues for this, uh, for this uh, composite map is going to give you this f prime. So, so why is this composite surjective, or nearly? The first map is surjective um, by an application of Ihara's lemma, which originally appeared in work of Bertolini and Darman. And the second one is almost surjective, at least locally at M, because of this bound from Helm. So um, the questions about, about how this is proved, maybe? Is uh, sorry, is a naive question. Is the mm -hmm. like this error ex actually expected in in general? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I would expect it to be. I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I don't have computational examples or anything. But I, I really think it would be. I don't know. Maybe someone disagrees. Yeah, thank you. Because the the thing is that the. It really multiplicity one really does fail for for these uh, for these Shimura curves. Like that's not like that's that's a real thing. That's not just a like a limitation of of what we can prove. Okay. Um. So let me now. So that that was the level raising. Um. Now let me talk about the uh, construction of the Kohli Laden classes, and hopefully I will soon answer your question, Tony. So, um. Th this is where. Uh, we see these conditions on N. I don't really want to uh, talk about what these conditions are accomplishing, but um, Kohli Wagen in his construction used these primes L, which had this special congruence. So, so that our N is going to be a product of those primes. Um, Q is a product of, uh, of primes as well. It's a level raising set for F. Um, I guess it, we need this to have the right number of prime factors. Um, and every, every um, prime here in sight, every sort of auxiliary prime, you want to be inert in K. 
So we get a we get a point y and q um, that lives on the Shimura curve, um, which is just the usual CM point. Now, if you want to turn this into a cohomology class, um, you you're sort of the way this is usually done when q equals one or when you have a lift to characteristic zero is by a modular parameterization. But there's there's no such thing because fq is just a mod p to the m eigenform. Um, so there, so there's no math like this. So but we still we still can can take this uh, this point and put it into um, the correct uh, Galois cohomology. And here's how. So we we start from j n plus n minus q. Uh, that's the modulo Jacobian. We map into j min using the uh, non-canonical isogeny. And then we uh, we take the Coomer image, which lands in the uh, torsion of J min. Um, so the torsion of J min um, it is closely related to the um, Tate module of, of J min, uh, reasonably so. Um, and in fact, if you have a level raised f uh, f q, that's a map from t n plus n minus q. So that, that really gives you a map from this Galois representation into the P to the M torsion of E. So what, what and then you have to do um, a little work with the Kohli-Wagen derivative operators, the same way that Kohli-Wagen did in the 90s, um, to go from this point over Kn to a point actually over K. But th that's the um, general story of how we get the CM n comma Q. Um, so Tony, um, if, uh, do you still have your question? Because I'll, I'll be happy to try to answer it again. If you still I think have I just, it. So, so what I understood was um, the summer group attached to FQ depends on not just FQ, but like it's, but on F. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So it's it's really not intrinsically attached to FQ. It's actually attached to F. Um, Got it, thanks. Q. Yeah. All right. Great. Um. Yeah. Okay. So. Let me recall the structure of the proof um, and sort of what we have left to do. So we have these two-dimensional Euler system relations. Hopefully now, um, now I can convince you of why you would expect to have this little error term in the um, in this relation. So I should say both these relations just come from sort of geometric facts about how these CM points are related to each other on the different Shimura curves and of the different conductors. So they come from geometric things. But to translate the geometric things into relationships for these cohomology classes, you get this little error because we've defined these classes using this sort of non-canonical map that could be losing some information. So that's that's really where the error term is coming from. Um, and then and then we said um, that there's some sort of downwards process where if CM1Q is really high order um, and you've sort of chosen Q well enough, then you'll get that CMN1 is non-zero for some n. So this we we needed to control CM1 comma Q. So if G is a characteristic zero sum or rank zero modular form of level n Q little Q with this congruence, then you can bound the localization at little Q of CM1 Q using the rank zero BSD. So so let me say how you do that. So um, there's a special value formula um, proven, I guess, by by Gross. Um, that if so that uh, relates this LG over K comma one to the uh, to this to exactly the localization of this cohomology class. Um, I mean, he didn't formulate in terms of this cohomology class, but uh, yeah, that's not hard to show. Um, and so suppose that the level raised that is sort of summer group that, as Tony said, really depends on on your original E and on Q. Suppose that that vanishes at level Q little Q. Then that turns out to mean that that the Selmer group for G also vanishes. Um, sort of there, it might not literally vanish, but it'll um, it'll be very small. Uh, so definitely rank zero and and uh, Sha will be small. And then you can use a rank zero BSD formula, which relates the size of the Selmer group to the special value. Um, and so this is where the really um, heavy hitting Iwasawa theory input comes in. And then there's also um, a lot of other work that goes into showing this formula. Um, so 
yeah, Ribbit Takahashi, Kar, Kare, uh, that's all Pollock Weston. Um, if you put it all together, um, you you get that the order of the localization at Q of CM1Q is at least M minus a constant that depends on F. And that constant is coming from, um, you know, like maybe this, maybe the Selmer group of G isn't literally zero, maybe it's just very small, issues like that. Um, right, so then uh, from here, uh, then, then we can go down and we can get that the order of uh, some class at level one is at least M minus constant times F minus how many primes you had to put in times the constant depending on the minus. Um, yeah, but if but if we're going to use this this uh, right so right so let me uh, just point out here that it's from this it's not so hard to see that you can take m big enough because um, nu of q it turns out is also sort of predictably bounded we can know how many uh, primes we're going to have to put into q so if you just make m like bigger than this other term then the right hand side will be positive strictly positive and then you have non vanishing. But if we're going to use this, that FQQ cannot be just a mod P to the M modular form, because you know all this all this powerful stuff um, is not is not going to apply unless you you genuinely have a lift. Um, so, right, I guess maybe before I start talking about deformation theory, um, I could pause for more questions about this. Okay. Um. Cool. So. Right, so the general story of deformation theory, um, I'm sure you all know, but um, just to uh, make things explicit, uh, let's fix our residual representation rho bar. In this case, it's going to be the p torsion of E. So if you have a set of primes S, uh, if, and you're interested in representations that lift rho bar and are unramified outside S, these are sort of controlled by um, a global cohomology group. So this is the Galois group of Q on ramified outside S and coefficients in add zero row bar. Add zero because we only ever want uh, weight to modular forms with trivial character. So all of the determinants will be fixed for the deformation theory. And by controlled, I mean, obviously what I really mean is there's a universal deformation ring whose cotangent space is this. Um, and that's not all of the data, I mean, there's a lot more data, but some more data is the obstructions, which live in the in H2. So yeah, so the Galois cohomology is telling you about, about, um, about the deformation theory. So Ramakrishna, um, almost 20 years ago now, had a really um, sort of amazing and uh, very powerful idea, which is that by putting primes into S, you would think it makes things worse because um, the more primes you have, the more flexibility, right? So You'd think it makes it harder to uh, to get your lift, but you can if you sort of put primes into S and also say what you want the lift to look like at the primes in S. You can use those primes to kind of regularize your deformation problem, and you can ensure that lifts exist. So Ramakrishna wanted to do this originally um, because he was interested in uh, Sayre's conjecture and the fontaine maser conjecture. So Sayre's conjecture says some nice row bar should be modular. fontaine maser says some nice piatic representation should be modular. So Ramakrishna, um, you know, I, I, the original motivation in his paper is that um, if, you, if you start with a mod p thing and you can turn it into a piatic thing, then, then Sayre is sort of reduced to fontaine maser um, But it was sort of um, noticed I, I think, I believe this idea first appears in the li literature in a paper by Camperino and Pacetti. Um, you, this same kind of process you can also use to make really deep congruences between modular forms. So Ramakrishna started with something mod P. We start with something characteristic zero and we, and we want to find a different lift. Um, and right, so this, you're going to have extra level um, corresponding to the extra primes that you're putting in, um, but it's going to be sort of very easy level. It's going to be Steinberg. Um, and in the modular form side, that means it's going to be square free level. So all the sort of level raising stuff, um, you know, works. Well, you know, this, this, uh, this Steinberg level like causes no problems for us. Uh, and of course, those, those will be the primes Q. 
Um, yeah, so for transparency, I want to mention that you, you need um, a bunch of hypotheses uh, to do this. Um, so here's a sampling of some of the hypotheses you need. So this, um, yeah, so you certainly need some kind of piatic Hodge theory conditions, but if, if you're interested in, uh, you know, P a prime of good reduction for a weight two modular form, um, then, it, then it does work. Uh, I guess, except for the large image. So you want row bar to, to uh, be surjective. Um, right, so let's, uh, let S be the set of bad primes um, for rho, so that's primes dividing n, p, and infinity, and Q is the set of primes where we're going to add the Steinberg level. Um, so for so for each L and S, uh, let rho L be the re restriction of rho F corresponding to our original elliptic curve, restricted to the decomposition group at L. And for a prime in Q, we let rho L be a Steinberg representation that's unramified mod p to the m. So these row Ls, these are like our targets. We want to build a representation that'll look like these row Ls locally everywhere. Um, so how you how you work with this concretely um, is you make these local conditions inside the uh, local Gawa cohomology. So there's a certain subspace NL of row L um, that sort of corresponds to your desired row L. And in, in many situations, it's going to be, if this local deformation ring is smooth and say you want the Steinberg quotient, um, this is going to be like the inclusion on cotangent space that comes from that, um, that comes from that quotient. Um, it might, uh, if you don't have a smooth local deformation ring, you can still define such an NL. Uh, it'll just uh, have a, ne a less immediately obvious geometric interpretation. So here's here's sort of the um, the the lifting method of Ramakrishna. So start so say you start with row f and you reduce it mod p to the m. So you get something row f m, and it lifts to a characteristic zero representation with the correct local behavior if you have these two properties. Um, so one is saying that um, you. Uh, you have an injection on H2, and two is you have uh, a surjection uh, on sort of this sum or group map for H1s. So let me say how you use these, these two properties to, to do your deformation. So we're sort of going to go inductively. So we start Z mod P to the N, and we're going to go to Z mod P to the N plus one. Um, and of course, we'll start with N equals N, although Ramakrishna would have started with N equals one. So if rho n is a mod p to the n representation that's compatible with the local conditions, um, then each, if you localize at any L, you, you actually know that it lifts to mod p to the n plus one because it actually lifts to characteristic zero because it's compatible with rho L. So if you, so, right, so the question of whether you have any lift at all is controlled by H2. So there's an obstruction class that governs whether you have a lift. And it by, by this sort of inductive hypothesis that you were compatible with rho L, um, it's the, the obstruction vanishes locally. So by one, uh, the, the obstruction also vanishes globally. And there's some global lift of rho N mod P to the M plus one. But we're not done yet because this lift might not be compatible with our local conditions, um, in which case uh, we'd sort of uh, be back to square zero. So we, once you have some lift, you can get other lifts by uh, adding a co-cycle. Um, so locally, so, so what two is really saying is that you can find a global so co-cycle that does everything you need locally to transform your your lift uh, into something compatible with the row Ls. So you have some random lift, maybe uh, maybe problematic at some Ls. There's a class here that would make it satisfy that would make it compatible with row L. And because this is a surjection, you can make global you can have a global cocycle that sort of behaves correctly at every at every um, local place. Um, so to summarize, ooh, okay. Um, to summarize, here here's sort of what it what it boils down to. What we really need to 
uh, require of our level we're using set. Um, so let's let t be q little q, just to make it uh, less confusing because, uh, uh, yeah, we, you know, q was the, like we have the even versus odd uh, q. Okay, anyway, so the first thing is that the Selmer group, this, uh, this summer group that depends on E and on T should vanish. And the second one, um, well, Richard Taylor reformulated those two lifting conditions um, in sort of a, a, a simpler way um, as just saying that this summer group vanishes. And that, that's this reformulation uh, uses that the, the local conditions NL have the right dimensions. In any case, um, so, we have sort of two Selmer groups that we want to make zero by uh, putting primes into T. And there's a very general way to bump down Selmer groups. Um, you, what you do is you, you add primes into T, which make certain classes non-zero. So these are classes in add zero row bar, or it's dual, or, or even in, in the p-torsion of E. Yeah, and so then, uh, what all you have to check essentially is that um, you can do this in a consistent way so that the the co-cycles that you want to um, bump down, that you want to make not vanish locally are should be independent. But uh, that's that's not hard to do because these are all just irreducible representations of different dimensions, at least when when the image is large. Um, yeah, I want I want to talk about so in the in the last, uh, few minutes here, I just want to mention um, a limitation um, of, of this deformation theory method and something that can be done about it. So I, I've set everything up where we're talking about coefficients in Z just to um, you know, make, make the notation cleaner. Um, but you know, in, for a general uh, F uh, with coefficients in some ring of integers O, um, you're going to need to, to make the argument that I just gave actually work you're going to need an unramified prime of O, so unramified like over, you know, over P, a rational prime, with the image of rho bar containing all of SL2 of O mod P. So that's actually kind of restrictive. Um, and the, the reason you need this is that some co-cycles could actually interfere with rho. So I said the co-cycles are independent of each other, but that's not the only condition because you also need them to be level raising primes modulo a very large power of P. So that's a, some condition about what they look like in row M. So if you sort of look at the Chabotara conditions you want to impose, you wanna say that somehow this extension is independent of that extension and that you can require, you can require something in row M that doesn't interfere with requiring something in, in, the, um, in the extension corresponding to a co-cycle. But that, that won't actually happen, or it can it can genuinely fail if um, if these these hypotheses are unsatisfied. Um, but I want to say that if that if this really depresses you, um, I, I, I urge you not to be depressed because um, there's some really really cool um, uh, work by Fakrudin, Kari, and Petrikas. Um, so just within the the last couple years, um, that really kind of upgrades this Ramakrishna lifting machinery. So if you're, so your issue, the, the problem, those problematic co-cycles, um, sort of you can never make go away by adding, by adding auxiliary primes. But instead you can annihilate only the image of this map. So this is like some mod P to the R Selmer group, and this is its reduction mod P. So uh, the idea is that this, you won't make this Selmer group zero, but you'll make the image zero. And somehow that's enough to still get your lift. And that would allow you to handle um, forms F with more general Galois image. So containing GL2 of ZP, you could definitely handle. Um, it gets a little bit trickier, but still um, I, I think doable if you have, um, if you have like a, a dihedral uh, image of your Galois representation. And I'm currently writing up some work in progress where I, um, I sort of as a sandbox to explore um, uh, the, these kind of upgrades, um, uh, I cover some new cases of the Higner point main conjecture. So a lot of cases are known due to um, uh, uh, work by, by these authors, um, but you, you can sort of do a, 
it's actually a pretty similar story to the one I, I told you about today, um, where you you your input is the anticyclotomic main conjecture, main conjecture in rank zero, and you have a really deep congruence of modular forms, um, and that gives you the flexibility to sort of um, downgrade your te your technical hypotheses um, by a by a decent amount. Okay, um, so that's that's all I had to say. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for coming, and obviously, I'll be happy to answer more questions. People have them. All right, let's all uh, unmute and clap and thank Naomi. All right, questions. So is, is the outlined approach uniform for P ordinary or super singular? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, so you can, so, okay, for the Kolyvagin conjecture story, yeah, you, the only place where ordinary versus super singular comes into the picture is for this rank zero input. And there you have to use, I mean, you can think of it as uniform, but it was completely different, uh, you know, it's, it's, Different papers, different proofs that um, prove the Iwasawa main conjecture in um, in sort of the the rank zero situation um, for uh, super singular and ordinary primes. Um, so except for that little input, you don't have to think about ordinary versus super singular for the rest of the Kolyvagin system argument. For the for the Higner point main conjecture, um, that that's sort of only only an ordinary thing. Um, well, the you have to be much more the, the cases are are completely different uh, once you're once you're doing actual US solid theory. So you've carefully like all of us, you've carefully avoided like small primes like P equals two or three. Um, have you thought any at all about at least p equals three? Now two, I don't think anyone should have to think about two. <laughs> yeah, I've, I have actually um, given quite a bit of thought to p equals three. Um, at, at a certain point, it was um, felt like I, I was uh, making things very complicated to, to handle some small extra cases, but p equals three, I think you can do. Um, and here's why. So the, the, I think the usual thing that, um, the reason people, often avoid p equals three in this business is that your auxiliary primes, you want to be not congruent to plus or minus one mod p. Um, but I, I think it should be it should be really okay if your primes, like if your mod three, say it's congruent to two mod three, but it's congruent to like five mod nine. Um, so I think you could incorporate it into the error term in the same way. P equals two much, much harder because you don't have you don't have this. Uh, I mean, I don't think you have the BSD formula as an input. Um, all of the stuff that with multiplicity one gets really hard. All of the deformation theory gets really hard. Yeah, so you encounter far more problems with p equals two than with p equals three. Can you briefly say in your work on the Hig forthcoming work or work in progress on the Higner point main conjecture, which hypotheses you're sort of relying? Yeah, so yeah, I didn't I didn't want to um, write too much, put too much in writing um, sort of in case of emergency. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it is being written up now. And um, so I think I think I could handle P equals three. Um, I think Certainly, we don't need this hypothesis CR, which is um, taking care of the this C1 of n factor in the in the um, maps between the modular Jacobi and the Schmerer curve. So uh, you could have residually dis dihedral Galois image. So maybe it's better to say what, what hypotheses are still there. You need absolutely irreducible, and you need p at least three. Um, but I, I think I think most other things you could do away with. And maybe a little bit, maybe a little extra on the Galois image when p equals three. Um, like there are some, there are some bad, like maybe when p equals three, it shouldn't be dihedral, or something like that. But, uh, so, so, sorry, but like the uh, Eva's our main conjecture, like 
Chris uh, is not known in the residually dihedral case. So the, it's not known even for p greater than three. Well, one direction is right. Um, uh, but but here one needs another direction at least usually. I mean, I, I don't. Um, you actually you only need one direction. You only need the direction that um, that Skinner and Urban proved because uh -huh. you you make the Selmer group zero. So if you know the Selmer group is zero and the the divisibility goes in the right way, that then the L function is not too divisible by p. But but that is I mean maybe I'm confusing, but that mm -hmm. excludes the residually dihedral case. It is excluded in their work. Um, I don't think so. But Chris Skinner is here, so we could ask. We can ask him. Yeah. yeah. Remember these things. Um, well, we we do make this troublesome hypothesis that there's a prime of multiplicative reduction, which is shows up in the residual representation. So that would seem to um, exclude at least ah, the Hebrew. I see. OK. Um, right. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. So the, there's in, so in the Coley-Wagen uh, situation, you can, um, you can avoid this. Um, so I said that there was at least one prime of multiplicative reduction, but you don't need it to be, um, you don't need it to actually be residually ramified. It, it's sort of that you can incorporate that into the error term. But that, yeah, I actually, the, so it's good I didn't put it on the slide because I, I think it's possible that that could, that could really be an issue. Um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Because if you're specializing at different characters, um, your sort of your life is harder. If you're specializing at the trivial character, you you can incorporate this into the error term because you um, you have uh, like work of Kato and and other things. Um, but yeah. So this this m infinity is like some sort of algebraic rank type thing. Is there is there like a sort of conjecture for what it what it means? For example, analytically. Um, I I'm not I'm not really sure. The incarnation in which uh, I'm familiar with m infinity is just as, as sort of this Tamagawa number stuff. Um. Uh, that that was in the rank one case. You said. What was that? This formula here in terms of Tamagawa numbers is in the rank one case. Yeah, um, I think well in the higher rank case, um, it's it's less clear what it is because the the these Kolyvagin classes aren't directly related to the to the values of the L function, like the derivatives of the L function in the higher rank case. Oh, okay, I, I thought they were always some sort of like Maser tape type derivative. Maybe I'm confused. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. But these 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 numbers MR they they know all about Shaw. So um, this the distinction between the first finite one and the value of m infinity. Um, is going to tell you the length of, of Shaw, so that so that quantity uh, should certainly be part of uh, like the the BSD formula in any in any rank. Thanks. If there are no more questions, let's all uh, unmute and uh, thank Naomi again.